Augustus Caesar. It was in January 27 BC that Octavian became Augustus Caesar. The gates of Janus were still closed. Peace and prosperity and order seemed to have returned to Rome. And now on the first day of that month, named for the old God who watched over all gateways and beginnings, the Senate voted that the statement's crown of oak leaves be accorded Octavian as a mark of his service to the state, and also the special title of honor which had been selected for him. None of the names or titles by which he was then called had seemed to them sufficiently distinguished. Although in time Caesar... Imperpetrator precepts all of them were to become titles of royalty. They had no such meaning then. Caesar, which was to become Caesar and Kaiser, was but a personal name which Octavian had inherited from his adopted father. Imperpetrator, which was to become emperor, was the title given to any victorious Roman general in chief. Precepts, which became the word prince, meant simply first citizen. In the state, in the senate, his name stood first on the roll call. Some more distinctive titles should certainly be found. The senators believes for this man, um, let's see, for this man who was now looked upon as the second founder of the state. But what? Romulus, the name of the first founder of Rome, was suggested as appropriate but turned down because Romulus had been a king and Rex or king was still an evil-sounding word in the Roman ears. Augustus met with approval. It was an awe-inspiring and suggested a leader especially chosen by the gods and acting under divine guidance and protection. Since that was what Octavian sincerely believed about himself, he was the most gratified by this choice. On the Ides of January 27th B.C., therefore, by the vote of the Roman Senate, Octavian was given his new title of Augustus. By vote of the Roman Senate, that was an important point. The Republic had not been destroyed. Octavian had presented Rome with a new constitution, which preserved all the outward forms of the old Republic. But it was only an empty shell, within which he himself could actually control the Roman world. To reach this unique position, Octavian, Octavian had followed a middle course, cleverly combining the conflicting advice of Agrippa, Agrippa and Messinus. Two years before, immediately after his military triumph, Octavian had started to put the long, disorganized Roman world in order. He had asked his two friends for their opinion as to how to go about it. Should he continue to keep the power in his own hands, or should he let the Senate have control again, and so bring back the Republic? Which, in the long run, did they think would be the best for Rome? Agrippa was in favor of the Republic, Messinus against it. Councils elected every year are far safer for the country than a king, said Agrippa. The son of a good king often turns out to be a tyrant. Rome had begun with kings, he continued, six of them. But the sevens had been such a tyrant that the kingdom had had to be overthrown. The republic had then been established, and as a Roman, a republic Rome had flourished and grown strong. Messinus disagreed. For the past hundred years, he pointed out the republic had been so weak and the senate so corrupt that one military leader after another had tried to overthrow the government and kept Rome constantly in civil war. The Republic had worked well enough, he admitted, while Rome was a small city state of the size for which that kind of government had been planned. But it was not suited to the great empire of many providences and conquered peoples that Rome had now grown to be. Octavian had listened to both arguments. He wished truly to do what was best for Rome. There were many plans made by Julius Caesar, many of his own that he wished to carry out. But to do so, he knew that he must avoid Caesar's mistake of making too much show of his authority. Therefore, he proceeded cautiously. First, he won the confidence of the senators by treating them with utmost respect and submitting his every plan for their approval, as if it really mattered. 
then by insisting that the powers he held be voted to him for a limited time and not renewed unless agreeable. He dispelled any fear they might have had that he wanted to make himself king. Therefore, on the first day of January 27th B.C., when he dared to make the supreme test of offering to give back all the powers which he held, he was not disappointed. The senators did not accept his offer. Instead, they insisted that he keep all the power he had and gave him more, voted him the title of honor, and even decreed that from then on his name would be Augustus Caesar, and it should be included in formal prayers with the priests offered for the welfare of the Senate and Rome. Thus it was, within the hollow shell of the old republic, that Roman Empire took form and grew, meanwhile enlisting the help both Agrippa and a patron of architecture and the diplomatic Messinus, Octavian had gone ahead with improvements in Rome. A great building program was begun. The Senate membership was revised, and by 227 B.C., the government of Rome itself was in smooth running order. The time then had come. Augustus Caesar thought to consider his empire at large. All over the empire everywhere, he wanted law and order established. The people within its borders must live in peace and prosperity. The barbarians without mutt must be fenced out securely. A huge wall-sized map of the empire was suggested and designed by Agrippa. It would show the length, breadth, and population of every province from the Euphrates River to the Rhine and all the Roman highways connecting them with one another with Rome. It was to be painted later on the walls of the Portilio in the Forum. Plans were also made to set up on the Forum a golden milestone on which the names of all the chief cities in the empire and their distances from the capital could be engraved. To collect the necessary data, four geograph geographers were hired to travel through every country, make observations, and set back orders, send back orders and figures. They would also form a basis upon which each providence might properly be taxed. In the East, the providence were old, long civilized countries, well under the control of subject kings like Herod of Judea, who would protect their borders and collect their taxes. In the Northwest, the providence were no very different. The tribes of Gaul had never been entirely united. No accurate census had ever been taken of the people. There were much that needed to be done in the most primitive portion of the empire. So while Agrippa was left to take charge of the affairs in Rome, Augustus himself planned to go to Gaul, the land that was to become France, land of the Druid priests. <laughs>